have made great strides. We've made great strides in our country to improve the living conditions uh, for all. But it's, it's very apparent that there are huge gaps. Um, much needs to be done. Uh, we have, uh, the state has failed in many instances to improve the lives of uh, those who are the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, we see it every day. We see the divide between the rich and the poor increasing. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's got to do with the strength of state institutions. Uh, it's got to do with uh, accountability. Uh, it's got to do with the high levels of corruption in uh, municipalities, in every, in every sphere of government. Um, and, and these are things which erode the implementation of human rights. Uh, they take away fundamental resources. Um, and, and these are the things that we need to, as citizens, need to be aware of. So um, in answer, you know, partly yes and, and, and you know, partly no. Um, it's easy to sit here as a very privileged person and academic and speak about these issues, um, but the lives of, of everyday South Africans uh, are fairly grim. So uh, we must be aware of that. Indeed, and uh, spoken, might I say, Salona, like a true economist, even though you're not an economist, on the one hand, yes, on the other, on the other hand, no, it's always the best way to answer. Sintesh, let me bring you into the conversation. We then have a, a broad understanding of, of, of the rule of law, and both our previous panel members have spoken about um, uh, gaps in implementation. Uh, where do you see the gaps and what measures then as we lead into the next part of our conversation do you think need to be taken to strengthen it and in particular I want to thread back if we can to state institutions and this notion of accountability which seems to escape so many South Africans right now but uh, Serena let's start where where are the gaps and what needs to be done in order to fill them Sintish, that's a question to you, I beg your pardon. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yes, the gaps, <laughs> the gaps are, are, are all around us. And I think um, we've heard from a, a legal practitioner now and, and, a, and a law academic. Um, in, in my life, I'm just an ordinary person. And that's where I see... Uh, a lot of, of failures as well, not only on, on the part of the state, but also on the part of the citizenry, all ordinary people. We are apathetic, we are distrustful, we are lazy, uh, we deny our responsibilities, and um, we, uh, we contribute to a, a lawlessness. And if we don't stop that, and if we don't put our time and, and our effort into taking our responsibility and exercising it, then uh, we are going to suffer and we are going to not be able uh, or not, not really have a point if we point our fingers away from ourselves only. So um, the, the challenges to me is that every single person in society must take up the, the responsibility. The, the Bill of Rights does not only apply uh, from the state down to us, it applies horizontally as well. And we need to, to uh, do what we can. What is it that we can do? We can all uphold and advance the rule of law. If we look at, at what the rule of law is. It stands on, on four pillars. It has four elements, equality, transparency, accessibility of, of legal remedies, and an independent judiciary. Um, Advocate Gabriel will tell us more about that, I'm sure. But if we look at, um, at these, these elements, there are things that we can do and that many of, many of us do do um, to advance that. Um, if we look at, at the role that, um, that civil society plays through NGOs, 
uh, we see that there's a correlation between a strong rule of law and an active citizenry or, or ordinary people in a country. And many companies take up that the responsibility and empower their, uh, their staff, as does LexisNexis, through our rule of law uh, foundation, which funds and promotes certain projects and, and tools. Um, we might speak about a, more, a bit more about them. But if you, as an ordinary citizen, identify your, your grouping that you can help, your target audience that you can address and, and help to um, strengthen the rule of law, then, then you know, we, right. we can all build together. All right. Um, Advocate Gabriel, let's bring you back into the conversation and develop uh, the thinking that uh, Sintash has given us. Uh, I pick up on words like despair and, and apathy and the need for active citizenry. In this country's recent and rich history, we've seen so much of that uh, citizen power, so to speak, but there does seem to be a general despondency right now. How do we reignite that philosophy among South Africans in order to be more cognizant, do you think, of the, uh, of the importance and, and the power of the rule of law? I think, again, we, go, we must go back to the basics, is my view. Um, and again, in the words of Nelson Mandela, we, the people, speak through the Constitution. And in, in doing that speaking with our voices, we hold, we're meant to hold government to account. But more importantly, we're meant to, as a community, extend the rights that we want for ourselves to others in our community. And I think the one thing that stands out for South Africa, unlike most other countries in the world, is that we have a very active civil society. And when I say civil society, I include groups who are part of civil society, like the media, like NGOs, like companies such as LexisNexis. And to me, I think we've got to speak loudly about the fact that we own this constitution, but also let us not be hypocrites as citizens. How many of us wants um, an emergency housing camp? to be set up in our communities. How many of us is quite willing to extend the rights that we want to the person we despise most in our community? So it's a give and take, as Sintish says, we're meant to extend the rights horizontally, but at the same time, we mustn't forget that we speak through this constitution. We've really got to take it back and hold our leaders to account. I am going to circle back in just a moment because I, I do want to look and perhaps I'm being a little self-indulgent about uh, the role of the media in all of this. And I know that all three of you will have some powerful views on that. But uh, Salona, let me come back to you and the, uh, the importance of South Africa's world-class and enviable constitution in advancing the rule of law in this country. Do you think sometimes we have lost sight of the constitution as this important beacon in this process that perhaps uh, we take it for granted? Hmm. I think we do take it for granted. Um, as, a, as a law teacher, um, I, I'm, I think it's important that we, uh, we, we are critical of the constitution. I think it's, it's important that we see it as a living, breathing, document uh it's a, it is you know um, Adri um andrea says it's it's a pact and it is a pact that has been made with our society with our um with the government and and it's it's a social pact um but we must also understand that um it uh you know there are ways for and there are possibilities for it to to be better uh but but we can't even start that conversation, I think, if we haven't properly implemented what we have, and we haven't we haven't effectively implemented what we have. So sometimes I think you know, and um, you know, these conversations about um, about the constitution and being critical of it, 
um, are really conversations about implementation and effectiveness. Uh, I think we do take it for granted, um, you know, constitutions around the world um, in recent years have been influenced greatly by our constitution. Uh, the jurisprudence of our courts, our constitutional court in particular, has inspired uh, developments in other legal systems. Um, and so um, it's, you know, we, we have, we're, we're a global leader in terms of human rights. Um, of course, there's much that we can still work on. Um, there's much that, we get, that can still be done. Um, and, and I think we shouldn't take it for granted, this, this um, instrument that we have. We shouldn't take for granted um, the uh, transformative quality of the constitution. Uh, and the fact that there's still so much to it that we haven't yet properly explored, uh, that hasn't been taken to court yet. Um, and so uh, there's still so much in it. Um, and as a law teacher, I'm of course extremely biased uh, uh, on, this, on this particular issue. Um, I'm, uh, I'll be happy to hear what others think. I'll, I'll get to the others in just a moment, Solana, but I'm gonna push you a little bit. You talk about what we haven't implemented. What do you mean by that? I think, um, you know, they are, they, uh, there's, of course, you know, the Constitution speaks about uh, transformation in, in quite a complete sense. Um, um, it talks about, um, you know, the, it's, of course, quite idealistic, um, as all human rights documents are, the Bill of Rights in particular. Um, and it's meant to be aspirational. It's meant to, it's meant to, um, it's meant to be an instrument where um, one can never say one has truly fulfilled every aspect of, uh, of a right, because there's still so much more that can, that can be fulfilled. For instance, uh, you know, the, um, the right to, um, the right to access um, uh, healthcare, for instance, um, you know, we are inspired by the international law on, on the right uh, to healthcare. Uh, and that's the right to attain the highest, uh, that's the right to the highest attainable standard of health, which is quite a, quite a high ideal. Um, and, and our courts are meant to draw on international law in interpreting uh, this right in the constitution. And so uh, there's so much more to explore. Um, it's, it's not meant to be uh, a finite, uh, there, isn't, there aren't meant to be finite definitions of these things. It's meant to be uh, something that we are continuously working towards uh, to get better and better at. And, th and that's what I mean. So, Sintish, pick up on that argument, if, if you will. How then, if, if, if as Salona says, it's, it's a living, breathing document, and we absolutely understand that, how then does the judicial system, in your opinion, and also, I guess, society more broadly need to involve to make sure that we adhere to those principles that she is articulating to ensure that the rule of law is up? Well, we have to, to sorry, it, it is breaking up a little bit. Um, rights and the rule of law and principles and visions are all very powerful things. Um, and we've all mentioned them, but if we don't allow our actions to become principled and to, uh, to be constant and to, to incrementally build, then we're going to lose these things. The minute we stop insisting on our rights, it's, it's a little bit of a use it or lose it uh, situation. The minute we stop insisting on something and working at it, it, it tends to erode. Um, and therefore, when we start working on, on um, projects and uh, we start putting in our efforts, we, we can see um, the, the, the progress. We, within LexisNexis, for instance, commercially we do, you alluded to that in the beginning, um, a lot 
to advance the rule of law. We, we enable um, our customers to, to do things quicker, better, um, more efficiently. But we have to move beyond that. And, and that's one of the things that I enjoy about working at LexisNexis a lot is we, we are very supported if we want to go beyond that. Um, from, from our personal point of views, we are encouraged to donate our time and talent. And um, in this way, the, the department that I work in, um, the academic department, partnered with um, uh, uh, somebody we, who would be our customer, but the, namely the, the South African law clinics at universities, to, to advance what they are doing. So we are using um, technology information and, and uh, resources at, that we have, and we're sharing it with them to, to enhance their impact. And um, the specific project that we are involved in, we, we're making little videos and um, tech isn't always everybody's friend. So we also going really low tech and we're making um, flyers aimed at the clients of law clinics to help them first of all, know what their rights are, and then to exercise those rights so that we, that we um, get even more people active in the sphere. Um, and there it was, it was interesting to, in interactions with people, to realize that very often they don't even know their rights. Um, you know, we, we operate in a different kind of sphere where we know that it is, it is our right to be safe in our homes. Um, yet South Africa has a, a huge problem with gender-based violence and domestic violence. One of the um, videos, information videos and leaflets that we are making deals with that, where we physically tell people that this is what domestic violence is. There are nine sort of broad categories of behavior that constitute domestic violence. And you, in interacting with people, you realize that for some people, it's just a way of life, you know, but according to no, the I, law, I, it's not. I think you make a very important point that that disparity in terms of messaging and the unevenness is, is, is absolutely vital. Um, I'm going to keep a very close eye on the chat box as well, because I want this uh, conversation today to be as all encompassing as possible. So Advocate Gabriel, I'm gonna come back to you as we continue talking about the conversation. And uh, Tatum Kize, thank you very much for what I think is a very interesting question here. And uh, uh, Advocate Gabriel, I'm gonna to toss it straight to you. The question is, uh, is it possible that the constitution in its current form or certain principles therein is an obstacle to meaningful economic transformation in this country? And I guess it comes back uh, to what you were saying a little earlier about this document being uh, a, a, a living, uh, breathing concept that it's got to keep changing and evolving. Um, Andrea, would you like to have a stab at that and see if we can uh, address... Uh, uh, I'm going concerns. to try. I'm going to try. Is it an obstacle to economic transformation? <laughs> There's so many loaded concepts in there. <laughs> I, no, I'm, I, just... I'm not too sure how to answer it. But I like to be practical about these things. Let's take, if you want to talk about economic transformation in the light of ordinary South Africans, let's talk about land and land reform. And one of the crowning beacons of our Bill of Rights was a commitment to land reform started in the interim constitution. And we all understand the importance of property in the hands of ordinary people. It is wealth, it's economic freedom, it is the ability to buy food, to engage in a basic level of economic activity. So what has happened? In the 25 years I've watched and I've been briefed on land reform cases. 
both for government and both very often for ordinary human beings, the mamas and the babas. My own experience is that it all boils down to a problem of implementation again. Despite our interim constitution first being enacted in 1993, there are still thousands and thousands and thousands of land reform cases that are still pending, that have still to be investigated and brought to the courts by the organs of state responsible for processing those claims. And so if you want to start at the real basics of economic transformation, let's start with land. A few years ago, there was a ruling from the Constitutional Court that said land tenants who occupied, labor, labor tenants who occupied land. The situation was so dire in the administrative setup at the relevant government departments that a special master had to be appointed to assist government to implement the systems to make these constitutional promises a reality. Of course, that was appealed all the way to the Constitutional Court, who confirmed that it was necessary that government needed this assistance in the form of a special master. So if we look at economic transformation at a very practical, simple level, where is the problem there? It's not the Constitution. It's those who were entrusted with enforcing that Constitution. And to me, that's the basics in this country. We either go the way of Zimbabwe or we get our land reform correct. Those and it's an, argument, it's an argument, it's an argument, Advocate Gabriel, that doesn't just ex extend, does it, to land reform. It's across all spheres of change in this country. And of the critical so. issue here is to deal with ineptitude and inefficiency. And that, I'll come straight back at you and say, is, uh, add, is easier said than done, isn't it? Yeah. Let's add, let's move into a more rarefied space. Let's look at mining rights. That's, mm. that's the country as well. That's what we have over and above many other countries in the world. It's a huge source of revenue and income for this country. But when did we get our cadastral descriptions right? We don't have a system that is able to plot, schematically represent and identify things like mining rights. So most recently, to my joy, I learned that uh, the Department of Minerals and Energy Resources has finally gone out to tender to ensure that there's a proper GIS system in place. So when you talk about economic transformation, there are so many aspects of implementation, basic steps that still have to be coordinated and expedited through government and organs of state. Let's be clear, we are three decades into this constitution. What is the problem? Salona Lachman, why don't you pick that up if you can and answer that question for us. What is the problem? And here's a suggestion from one of our other uh, attendees today, uh, uh, Pumzile, talks about basic messaging, I guess, asking the question, do you think that South Africans understand the Constitution sufficiently? Uh, and if so, what can be what can what is the enabler? I, I guess is the question that would imply or guarantee greater understanding and greater entrenchment, which would therefore give us more influence and power. Um, do you want to take a stab at that, Salona? Sure. Uh, so I think education is the key. Um, I think I think education is the key, and I think it's it's got to do with the education of of our children. Uh, the education um, in our communities. Um, I think uh, it is about uh, people in, uh, in all areas of South African life, uh, of all ages, uh, being empowered and um, to know what their rights are, to understand what it means, to also understand that um, rights are not absolute. And so that rights have to work in tandem with the rights of others. I think that's also an important, uh, an important thing uh, for people to know that 
you know, we, we, one doesn't live in a vacuum, one lives in a society and that there are rights that must be balanced and, and one must know and, and understand the content of, of these rights. So, so I, I'd say that education is, is really important. Um, and, you know, just, just to, to tie in- Solana, let, let, me, let me interrupt you rudely, if you don't mind, but before we move on, how do you do that? How do you teach a better understanding of those rights? I think it's it's for 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 people like us uh, in the profession. I think the responsibility lies with us, uh, uh, those of us in the profession, um, you know, whether uh, in practice or in academia, uh, to use the platforms that we have uh, um, to to do this kind of work. In you know, do you, do you think that you're do you think you're failing to do that? Um, I I I I clearly we are. Clearly, we are. Uh, if if one uh, if one goes into uh, into impoverished areas, um, you know, it, it it would it would seem that we are. I mean, we have wonderful civil society organisations um, who do incredible work in impoverished communities, um, doing this kind of work. Um, you know, and uh, but but more can be done. Certainly, more can be done. Uh, and the responsibility, I think, uh, rests with us to use whatever sphere of influence we have um, to uh, to ensure that the, there's a there's a better understanding and uh, to use the expertise that we have. Um, you know, I, uh, there's a, there's a lot of great work done, by, you know, by our law students, for instance, uh, going out into communities, um, and and those of us who who are you know uh, qualified and are practicing etc you know there's more that we can do let, let me ask you this question Salona if I can we, we we all participate in a conversation like this and it's important and hopefully it sparks conversation and maybe it also acts as a call to action I don't know but if you were to look at South Africa and maybe look at other countries who are grappling with very similar issues in one way or another. Are we better or are we worse? How do we so, stack up? How do, how, how, do we, how do we measure up, do you think? Well, um, I, I think, you know, you know the, the, the UN has done quite a bit of work in, in measuring um, human rights uh, in, in states around the world. Um, most recently, um, South Africa um, was reviewed under a system of the UN known as the Universal Periodic Review. Um, and basically what that is, you know, and I, and I wish more people uh, knew about this and we, we spoke about this more. Um, it's, it's a system um, of the Human Rights Council where each uh, member state of the UN is, uh, every four years is, um, uh, reviewed to determine how well uh, they have, um, how well they are doing in terms of human rights. And our uh, most recent review was conducted in January this year. And uh, it's, it, it's an interesting uh, report to look at, especially if you look at it in terms of um, where we were placed four years ago. Um, whether we have improved things, at least uh, um, on paper. There have been some improvements uh, that we have made, uh, but the areas of concern uh, that, the U that the member states of the UN pointed out and, and sent us recommendations, most of which we have uh, supported as a state, uh, relate to implementation. Um, and um, you know, it's 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 hard to gauge uh, to say. Well, you know, are we better than X country or Y country? Um, um, I think on in certain in certain areas we are doing fairly well. Uh, at least, um, um, you know, we have the legal mechanisms in place. Uh, we have we're working towards uh, rooting out corruption and improving governance. Uh, for instance, uh, those are one of the recommendations made four years ago, and, and we have been working towards that at the moment. Um, but, uh, but certainly, um, there are uh, spheres that we, we could certainly work on uh, pertaining to uh, the rights of um, uh, stateless individuals, for instance, um, the rights of children. Um, um, Gender-based violence is an ongoing 
uh, topic of concern, um, you know, for us. Um, so, so they are. I would say that we. Um, it's. I, I. I. I'm not sure if you want me to to get, to place place us in the, the the top 50 states of the world, Jeremy. It's hard. It's hard to do that, but um, we we certainly have have a way to go. But I, I think we should use the UN mechanisms that that are available uh, to as citizens to put pressure on the state and to create awareness. Solana, it's that it's that old corporate cliche about you you can't manage any process unless you can measure it, and uh, if you have a document like this or or, or a framework by which you can measure not only progress but failure, at least that is a starting point. And it's interesting because I don't think a lot of attention has necessarily been given to this. Uh, to this United Nations document, again, just for the benefit of our audience. Um, I only learned about this two days ago, and I, I mean, I've gone back and had a look at it. And I think that uh, there's been a failure from the media side in picking up something like that and giving it, as we say in our business, uh, a lot more ink. So let's get on to the media if we can. I did raise that at the beginning of our conversation. Santish, maybe you'd just like to win very quickly here and give us your view and uh, advocate uh, Andrea Gabriel, I'll come to you in just a moment. Um, the media has a crucial role in, in reporting in, 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 and in explaining uh, the prescripts and, and the importance of of the rule of law, particularly as it pertains to human rights. And by the way, we are hosting uh, this uh, th this webinar in Human Rights Month, even though we're coming to the end of it. Um, so just a, a brief view on the media and where we might get things better in terms of uh, in terms of messaging. Sure. Um, yeah. In in my mind, the media. Uh, Obviously, there, there will always be room for improvement. Um, but in South Africa, we're doing a, the media is doing a very good job, I think, of, of um, alerting people and um, whistleblowing and uh, investigative journalism is alive and well. Um, it, I, I always marvel. <laughs> at the, the bravery of some journalists. Uh, just yesterday I heard um, an interview with a journalist who is dealing with um, cocaine smuggling um, via our harbors um, on, on big cargo ships. And she was saying that she's not aware of any threats to her life because she keeps private, but um, people, people risk their lives. I mean, we've got matters in the court where, where journalists are, are being taken uh, to court for, for what they do. Um, so although there, there is room for improvement, there's, uh, there could be um, some one-sidedness, there could be some lazy and bad reporting in, in some cases. Um, I, I do think that we are on a good footing in South Africa. Um, and I think that, that all of us um, need to do more and, and we need to perhaps also tell more positive stories. It's important to be aware of the negative stuff, but um, the... Uh, the positive stories are inspirational yeah. and, and could move people to action. I, I think you raise a very important point. Um, Advocate Gabriel, let's pick up on a point that Sintish has just made about whistleblowers. Um, important, but we don't have a great tr track record in this country, do we, when it comes to the treatment of whistleblowers, uh, shameful. In, in, in some Shameful. respects, we don't need to go into the into the myriad stories. But the reality is that whistleblowing is a critical part of, uh, of advancing and upholding the rule of law, isn't it? It is. It is. And despite all of the lofty laws and the protections that we've passed in this country, we, we truly have a beautiful set of laws in this country. 
The problem again is the implementation. And I see, Jeremy, that one, you know, one of the questions that has come up on the chat box, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to get to it. Is, no, go straight to it, please. Right. It's really one of the panelists has, one of the members has asked, do our leaders actually understand the constitution? And I don't think they do. And I'm thrown back to what we did when at the inception of constitutionalism in this country. I'll come back to the media just now. The Constitutional Assembly was established and for years, for months, it went through the country educating people about basic rights, about the provisions of the constitution. And maybe we need another Constitutional Assembly to begin a process of re-education in this country of citizens, indeed of government leaders, because from recent mutterings in the National Assembly, it seems that some of our leaders have forgotten the very basics of the Constitution. And so everybody needs to be re-educated. Now, that's certainly where the media could help. Mm. Let me say up front. So, the Advocate Gabriel, let, let me ask you this question, first of all, though. What is the consequence of not understanding the basic principles of the Constitution. If, as Pumzili has said, suggested, uh, do government officials understand the Constitution, your suggestion is we need to work a whole lot harder because many don't. If there's not an understanding of it, what then is, is, is the impact? And I keep coming back to the, the title of this webinar, uh, Human Rights and the Rule of Law. What's the impact on human rights? We've denied our rights, the mamas and the barbers in society are denied their fundamental human rights. So somebody who's just been shot to has had a seizure, arrives at a hospital or local clinic and gets shooed away. And that poor somebody has no idea that they have a right to emergency basic health care. That is the impact on the lives of ordinary South African citizens. If you don't know that something that you have a fundamental right, you are not in a position to assert it at a very basic level. If you go into a driver's license center or um, an office to get your old age pension and your disability pension, and the security guard at the entrance just shoo-shoos you away, how do you enforce what is your right to collect on that day? <laughs> this notion that the public administration and our leaders are there handing out privileges is simply wrong. We've got to reset our society. And this is where the media could really play a role. There are so many decisions in the Constitutional Court which is already established beyond any doubt the importance of the media in this country. But I open the newspapers today. And all I read about is internal squabbles between the, the different political parties. Why is there not so much outrage over the fact that it's three decades later and young children are drowning still in pit latrines? Why is there not outrage that is three decades later and communities, entire communities, have yet to have one basic water standpipe? So I do think we need to shift focus, press a reset button, if you will, and the media is best place to handle this for us, as well as NGOs, as well as legal practitioners, as well as legal academics. We all have our role to play. Advocate Gabriel, answer the question that you've just raised. What's happened to the outrage, do you think? Why are we failing uh, to to be more angry about the things that count instead of focusing on uh, you know, the, the, the internal squabbles of political parties, which, let's be quite honest, uh, is neither here nor there in the greater picture of things or in the greater sum of things. Where's, what's happened to the outrage? And you know, uh, some of us are, are older than others. I, mean, I remember as a, as, a, as, a, as a practicing journalist in, in, in the late yeah. 80s and the early 90s, there was a perpetual sense of indignation about the things that really counted and that yes. gave grist to the mill. That seems yes. to have gone. I wonder why. Where's the outrage? How do you get it back? Well, we've in certain instances perhaps <laughs> become too comfortable 
maybe we become too depressed, some of us. Um, but I do see the outrage. I mean, let's just take again a practical example. So you see the outrage, but is, it, is the outrage directed at the right issues? I guess is the question. Let's take a practical example. Last week, Human Rights Month, I think it was government that organized constitutional review conference. And there were members of the SABC there say, interviewing people at the conference saying, where are the mamas and the babas? Who are the attendees at this conference? Why are there no ordinary people here? You seem just to have a select invitation list. Then on the other side, this very weekend was a whole Take Back Your Constitution Festival organized by NGOs, um, led, for instance, by leaders such as Mark Haywood, where it was back to the basics. These are your rights. So where has the outrage gone? I think we've been worn down as a society with so many challenges, with the COVID pandemic, with the floods, but I do think that there is still smoldering coals that we need to reignite. And again, I can't stress the importance of civil society. Mm. And I include the media as part of civil society and NGOs. And, and Salona Lachman, part of those embers, I guess, have been dampened by this constant corruption which is a major obstacle to upholding of the rule of law it undermines public trust in the legal system it leads as we know to uh, injustice and inequality and uh, to, to to advocate gabriel's point um maybe that fatigue has now just become too overwhelming given that uh i'm saying that because i am as a practicing media professional uh, paid to be cynical I, I, you know, I think um, I think we shouldn't forget that um, you know we many of us uh, turn to social media, um, you know, uh, for our daily dose of um, news items, uh, etc., and um, or we, we turn to apps, etc., and and there's an algorithm and uh, there's an echo chamber that's created. And so when you keep reading the same stuff over and over again, you know, the, you know, of course, I, I'm not a journalist. Um, I'm just, I'm also a cynic in, in some ways. Um, you know, the, the, the news outlets know what sells. Uh, what is it that people are reading? Um, what is it that is going to grab headlines? Um, or what are the names? And so we, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, we are the ones uh, who keep clicking on these I uh, these news items pertaining to political parties and their squabbles uh, because it's often dramatic and uh, and we keep doing it and and these apps and these algorithms keep feeding us these stories over and over again um and 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 that in turn i think influences um what the media reports on to some extent i think there's the I, in my opinion i think there's there's a bit of that um and 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 of course i think there's apathy on the part of of uh, ordinary citizens you know we corruption is not something that um um that creates as much outrage as it used to i think we uh, we've unfortunately you know like like violence um we've become desensitized uh, to, to an extent i think um and and, and it comes back to something that's, uh, that Sintesh said earlier about not taking these things for granted, um, because when we, when we stop, um, when we start taking, you know, these rights for granted, um, that's when we stand to lose them. And we've seen that happen in other parts of the world. Um, so it's, I, I think we are also, um, you know, uh, media consumers are partly to blame for creating an echo chamber. So let's talk about how Sintish to bust out of that echo chamber, if we can. And some of the work that you do is creating content which is aimed at a younger cohort. In other words, the legal leaders of tomorrow. How does the debate, in your opinion, need to change, particularly in terms of tonality and messaging? Um, I 
especially when we when we deal with the youth um, or, or younger people, um, I think we need to inspire them. Um, I think we need to to give them an appreciation of what their value is and what they their potential is. Um, we, we like to refer to students as future professionals right, because of that um, aspirational, um, uh, the aspirational value of that statement. Um, and, and we also need to give them the responsibility and we need to trust them a little bit um, to, to do the right thing. Um, I, I recently drove with my son in a car and he, he's a, he was a teenager at the time. He's a little bit older now. And, and we approached a stop street and um, from the side, an older lady skipped the stop street on her side and turned in, in front of us. It wasn't a dangerous situation, but... Um, my son took the breath from, from my lungs when he said, now that lady is probably one of those people who will complain about the ill discipline of the youth and the lawlessness on the roads when the taxis start appearing. And I realized at that point that so much is is locked up in our children that, that we need to set free. They've got strong opinions. They see things. And they, they are, as you say, they're the leaders of tomorrow. So we need to alert them to the fact that they've got stuff to fix that we have to take responsibility for, that we are breaking on a daily basis. So um, the messaging should be, that you need to be empowered. You need to look to people that can empower you. Don't be apathetic. Take part in whatever you can take part in and, and take what, what the older generation is able to give you, the good. You have to discern between <laughs> what people do that are wrong and not follow that, it's difficult, but we need to give them the opportunity to do that. And to really tap into what, what there is that we can give them. Um, give them a, a, a lot of, of opportunities to, to go out into society. Um, universities are, are very well placed to reach society. Um, Companies like LexisNexis, we've got a, a, a very broad customer base. We are really, really able to reach all kinds of, of levels mm. of society. Um, and, and if we work together and strengthen what others do as well, not necessarily just trying to reinvent the wheel. This is, we, we keep on saying we have to just go back to the basics, just implement what we do. All of us implement, um, implement, especially the rule of law, or we get opportunities to implement and strengthen the rule of law in our daily, um, in our daily lives right. by just upholding basic laws. Sindra, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I do have a, a keen eye on the clock and um, we are starting to come to the end of this conversation. But before I go to, to the panel members uh, for some broad closing remarks, um, Advocate Gabriel, you've got to answer this question. Uh, and there's nothing that I like more than a, a good hypothetical question. And this is one from Cindy. Cindy, thank you. If there was one thing you could change in the Bill of Rights, what would it be? Would you add something more to it, change it completely? Uh, would you like to have a stab on that, given that uh, the best questions are often hypothetical questions? Andrea, over to you. I'm thinking that's a tough one. It's a very um, tough one. Thank you, Cindy. 
<laughs> Thank you, Cindy. You've got me dumbstruck. I never really thought about that. Um, if you can't, don't, don't think, worry about it. It's no, just, it's, I don't, it's, 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 I don't uh, think yeah. there is anything I would change in the Bill of Rights. What I would change is to add, and I'm going to be controversial, what I would change is to add a requirement that every single elected member into government and every single salaried member of the public administration has to take an oath to the constitution and to the people of this country. I would make it a constitutional requirement. That's what I would add, because I think it often gets lost in translation, especially after three decades, that the people who are meant to serve us believe that they are above us, but they're not. They are our servants. And let us not forget that. Uh, I think all too often uh, that the one side of that equation tends to completely ride roughshod over that very important principle. Uh, Salona, is there anything that you'd add or change? So you knew this question. You knew I this knew question it. was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I knew. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Um, I, you know, I think. Um, I, I guess this is also controversial. Um, I would say that the, you know, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't uh, take anything out. Uh, but like uh, Andrea, add uh, something. And I think, um, I think it's really important in our society that. Um, we uh, reckon with um, the patriarchy uh, and that the constitution is read from a feminist lens. Um, I think we, uh, you know, the constitution, of course, one can read it as it is through a feminist lens, um, but I think um, it would be much more impactful if we, if it, if it was explicit. Um, that we understood it through the lens of, of the girl child, of women. Uh, I think uh, women are the backbone of society um, and of our communities. Um, and uh, it, would, it would, in my opinion, uh, it would make a great difference. Um, and so perhaps that's controversial. Uh, but uh, so I, yes. I, And, and, and uh, Salona, as, as the father of two militant feminist daughters, who are both well steeped uh, in the theory. Um, I uh, can only say here, here to that. Uh, but if I didn't say that, I, I would be in deep trouble anyway. So uh, let's, let's leave it at that. Um, colleagues, we, we, we are coming to the end um, and we, we've poured a fair amount of, uh, of lemon juice and, and vinegar onto the debate today. So I'm gonna ask each of you to wrap up with two things very quickly. I want a view on the future of the rule of law in South Africa. And stemming from that, what's the call to action? Uh, because it's pointless having a conversation like this as interesting and as enlightening as it's been today, unless we can put a flag in the sand and, and say, well, you know, what, what needs to come out of this? So, Sintesh, let's come to you, first of all. Um, the future of the rule of law and give me a thought or two on what your call to action would be. It's, it's, it's not really um, feasible for the rule of law to be eroded. Uh, we, we are in big trouble if we allow it to, to be eroded. So um, we simply have to advance it. Um, we have to do all we can to advance it. And the call of action for me would be for every single person to start with him or him and, and herself. Um, obey the law, comply with it, uh, build it, uh, teach it, um, take part in every single opportunity to, you have to shape it and then work, take, take action, um, donate, give your time and talent to, to help others and to, um, to realize uh, 
people not only your own rights, but the rights of other people. We can all do that. We are all um, able to do something for someone else. Sintas, thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, Advocate Gabriel, the same question to you about uh, looking ahead and uh, also what your call of action might be. Can I again quote Tata Madiba when he opened the Constitutional Court? And this is my call of action 30 years later. He said, the authority of government comes from the people through the Constitution. Your tasks and responsibilities, as well as your power, come to you from the people through the Constitution. The people speak through the Constitution. My message is, and my duty is, I think that South African society must take back its Constitution and remind those in power that they are there to serve us. Mm. And a good starting point, perhaps, is to go and find that copy of the Constitution that was uh, printed, uh, tens of thousands of them, uh, all those decades ago, and uh, go and look at it again, uh, yes. and maybe put it on your bedside table. Not a bad, not a bad thought. Um, Solana, just before I get to you and, and your closing remarks, if you go to the uh, whole section of our webinar, uh, you'll see a couple of questions there, and we'd be very grateful if you would literally take a minute or two to, uh, to engage with them. The first one is, what is your biggest challenge when doing research for trial preparation? Uh, you have three answers, uh, three answers, time constraints, keeping up with changes in legislation or uh, volume of information to analyze. The second question is, what's the most, what is most important to you when doing legal research? Uh, depth of coverage, ease of use or customization. Uh, the third question, uh, is uh, would you be interested in attending more legislation-related webinars similar to this? I'm hoping the answer is a resounding yes to that. And uh, the fourth one is, would you like to be contacted to learn more about LexisNexis? It's a yes or a no. And I'm hoping that uh, we're preaching to the converted here that the answer is yes, because um, what I'll do before I get to you, so I'll just say that uh, we plan to do a lot more of these uh, monthly if we possibly can, because it's only through uh, critical dialogue and conversation uh, that we can uh, continue to advance the rule of law. So having said that, um, let me come back to you, Salona. I'll give you the final word, uh, your views on the future and what your call to action would be. Um, I um, I'm going to be quick. Um, my colleagues have have already some, summed it up very well. Um, just uh, from my end to add that um, I think that uh, we should be positive. I think we should uh, acknowledge the uh, strides that we've made uh, as a country. Um, and I think we should, of course, acknowledge uh, all the challenges and difficulties we have before us. Um, but um, you know, the rule of law is a fundamental principle of our democracy, a democracy that was hard won, uh, which people laid down their lives for. Um, it's something that we shouldn't take for granted. Um, human rights uh, is an important cornerstone of the rule of law, of, of upholding the rule of law. Um, and it's about strengthening uh, the system's accountability and um, and and you know and and it's about the responsibility on each of us uh, as citizens um, to hold the state accountable. So um, those are my final thoughts. Thanks. And um, that is is where we're going to leave it. Uh, Sintesh Duval, along with uh, Salona Lachman and uh, Andrea Gabriel, uh, thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for the thoughts that you have, or the thought that you have put uh, into this conversation today, and as I always say with a webinar like this, we're not going to we're not going to change the world in sixty minutes. Uh, we've had a number of attendees today, and all I ask is that uh, if there is one thing that has changed your mind, has given you a different perspective, uh, that has perhaps uh, recalibrated your direction in one way or another, then I think all three of us uh, would have done our jobs. We're gonna do a lot more of this because uh, conversation is absolutely critical uh, and there'll be another one next month and the one, one after that. Uh, and we will cover uh, the entire range of uh, 
of, of, of rule of law issues. So this one about human rights, we'll look at many other aspects of it as well, because it's only through dialogue and through conversation uh, that we're going to move the needle. So to all three of you, thank you very much indeed uh, to the organizers uh, behind uh, the scenes. Thank you very much indeed uh, for, for, for managing the technical side of this. Goodness gracious, uh, not a single technical hitch. And even when we hit load shedding here at LexisNexis headquarters uh, in Johannesburg, the generator came on very, very quickly. So I was delighted about that. To all three of you, thank you very much indeed to our audience today. Thank you so much for participating and uh, for, for watching us. Goodbye to you all and uh, have a safe day.